Thank you so much, Professor. It's a true honor to be here with you guys today. Uh, I'm excited for all the folks watching online as well. Um, as you mentioned, I, my name is Josh. I'm the CEO co-founder of Gusto. Uh, and I have a cool fact to share. I actually took this class about, let's see, 12 years ago. Uh, I was an undergrad master's student in electrical engineering at Stanford, uh, did signal processing. And uh, another fun fact, the three co-founders of Gusto were all electrical engineering from Stanford, and we're all technically PhD dropouts from the EE program here. So if you're in the program, stay in it. If not, things will work out if you decide to leave. But um, what I wanted to do today was uh, kind of go through a couple of chapters of my life, my journey, hopefully share some advice um, that's constructive to everyone here. The, uh, the quick summary on Gusto, though, is we're a company today, about 400 people based in San Francisco and Denver. Uh, we serve over 40,000 companies today across the U.S. with uh, what we offer, which is payroll, health insurance, HR. And we have investors um, that we're really proud of, the founders of uh, Instagram, PayPal, uh, Yelp, Evernote, Eventbrite, etc. Come on in. So like I said, the um, goal here is to be pretty interactive. If you guys want to jump in and ask questions during as well um, and or at the end, we can do either. Um, but we're going to basically go through kind of three different arcs. It'll be really focused around a little bit about me. I've always found when I was a student in these classes, sometimes people just dive into company or professional work. It's a lot more interesting if you can get a bit of a connection to the individual and see the connections, see the similarities probably more than the differences in our backgrounds. Um, but then I'll talk about my time here at Stanford and also obviously what we're up to at Gusto. More importantly, some of the lessons for you guys, assuming that you want to start a company yourself in the future or are planning to join a startup. So diving in, uh, a little bit about me. I was um, born and raised in the Bay Area, one of the few locals. Um, so if you guys have ever been up to Marin, right across the Golden Gate Bridge, it's uh, where I grew up. Um, awesome place for hiking. If anyone afterwards wants to get some hiking advice, I have some tips for you. Uh, and this is a picture of my family. Uh, I have one brother, and yes, our mother is about a foot shorter than the two of us and my dad. Uh, all I can say there is that powerful people come in small packages. Um, but uh, the other thing I would add on, on family and background, um, my parents are both the first in their families to go to college. My mom is actually an immigrant, came to the US when she was 18 from Bolivia. Um, and my dad is actually from a small steel town outside of Pittsburgh. His whole family had grown up working in uh, the steel factories and brick factories there. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about entrepreneurship, tech startups, but um, my definition of entrepreneurship is not just about tech startups. It's actually much more about a mindset where you want to change the way your life works, change the way the world works in some way. My mother moving to a whole new country, learning a whole new language, putting herself through school to me is a great example of entrepreneurship, which I think we can all draw inspiration from. Um, so that gives you a little bit about my family. Um, my childhood, um, jumping photos are just fun. So I thought I'd put up a jumping photo. Hopefully everyone here has done a jumping photo at some point in their life. I highly recommend it. But a uh, big part of my childhood was um, two things. Uh, Boy Scouts. My brother and I are both Eagle Scouts. Um, so a chance to really appreciate and enjoy the outdoors, um, which is, again, one of the beautiful aspects of being in the Bay Area. And then also uh, crew. And I've actually given some talks before where I talk about crew, which is rowing, as a great metaphor for leadership, we would row in uh, eight-person boats, um, so four on each side. I was starboard. Uh, it's about a 2,000-meter race. So it's over in less than six minutes. And the way it connects to leadership and management is you have this individual action you have to do, which is to pull in an oar. It's a very basic action. It's very personal. You want to just pull it as hard as you can, as fast as you can. Um, but then you have the balance in the boat. Right? So you're literally like an inch off the water. And you have four people on each side. And you're trying to figure out how to be in sync. Because if you're not in sync, you're basically going to be banging left and right and not going anywhere. And then you have a coxswain who's there um, basically helping to guide direct. But they can't make you do anything. Literally, they're just there talking. Right? But done right, they actually are a big part of your inspiration. They're a big part of how you work together in a common direction. So you see the connection to team building. Um, but for me, it was just fun to compete and try to win races. Um, and that takes me to Stanford. Um, my parents are both teachers, actually. My dad taught high school in San Francisco Unified for a good 20 plus years, but much more on the uh, English, history, social studies side of the house. And my mom was a Spanish and French teacher. So 
uh, I didn't really have any exposure to technology per se growing up, um, but I was always interested in uh, software and interested in how things worked. But Stanford was really, I would say, the first deep dive into what we now call tech startups. And so uh, I came to Stanford in 2001. It was right after the bubble had burst. So a uh, unique time to come to campus. I think between 01 and 03, there was actually a 40% decline in enrollment in the CS major, is what I was told. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's been corrected, given what I've heard about CS and EE enrollment at Stanford today. But um, it was a really unique time. And, and for me, at least, it was a chance to, I did EE, I did signal processing, dive into uh, topics I was interested in exploring. I think there's anyone doing engineering, a slight masochistic tendency. You got to love being in basements. We were talking about that during our lunch, the chance to go do research and try to um, challenge yourself and what you learn and what you understand. Um, but for me, it was great to combine hiking in the outdoors. As you guys know, Stanford has some great places to go explore with, um, for the first time, learning about engineering and learning about what it meant to be in a more academic, uh, structured environment. Um, I actually was going to do a PhD in neural prosthetics, um, which you could think of as probably not super related to payroll software and HR software. So there isn't any huge connection there. To me, it was more about um, trying to discover and learn how the brain worked. I think one of the most interesting um, complex systems that we still have a lot of learning to do today around. Uh, and my advice for you guys, I was going to ask you actually, how many folks here are, are undergrad? Raise your hand. A lot of undergrad. And then how many are in School of Engineering? Hopefully that's everyone. Cool. Um, so when I was an undergrad, uh, I think there's a, an easy dynamic to get caught up in on like what is the exciting thing to do, what is the exciting project to work on. It's really, in my opinion, more about exploring. Like every summer I did an internship in a different location. I worked at Intel for a summer, I worked in finance for a summer, I worked in VC for a summer, I worked in a software company for a summer, I worked in different labs each year. It's about exploring and discovering. By the time I was about ready to graduate, um, you have to choose though. So I chose not to do the PhD, uh, although it's a really interesting program, and chose to dive deeper into uh, building products. But I think that balance, that choice you make, is a deeply personal choice. And above all, just don't think of it as what is the right or wrong choice. There is no right or wrong choice. It's simply what you think is most interesting for you. And it takes a lot more introspection to figure out what that looks like. Uh, my first job out of school was at a company called Zazzle. I worked there as a product manager. Um, what drew me to Zazzle was really the chance to uh, build software, but also work with um, a really great group of people. They had just raised a Series A. It was about a 10, 20 person team. And I was a PM there, helping to enable people all over the world to make a living creating products that they loved. Um, but I was there for about three years. Uh, I would say it was probably the first deeper foray for me into how to go build software in a professional way, where you have deadlines, deliverables, multiple engineers involved, and uh, again, a different language than a school project, um, and a chance for me to get exposure to really smart people, while I knew at some point I would probably go be doing my own thing afterwards. And that leads me to the chapter before Gusto. Um, what I found really interesting with uh, the Zazzle experience, it was between 05 and 2008. Um, we were uh, growing very quickly. We got up to about 150 people. And I actually was doing my master's on campus part time. So we we're talking about this as well during lunch. Uh, if some of you ever want to create that loophole, I did a co term seven classes left, one class a quarter for three more years while working full time. It's kind of a nice way to get best of both worlds. But I was in a class in 2008 uh, that now is called the Facebook class. And it was right when Facebook platform was launching. Um, and this was back when people didn't know that Facebook could become something everyone uses everywhere. And so my friend and I, who were undergraduate classmates, started a company. But I described this chapter as a reactive chapter, not a proactive chapter, because we just started building stuff. And we had a way for businesses to build apps on Facebook. We had millions of users. We actually had thousands of dollars a day in ad revenue. Um, really only a few weeks into the project. And we you know, thought that meant we were being successful, right? I mean, it's supposed to be successful to have revenue and, and people using your service. But what was really confusing to us was we didn't really feel like we had a company. And after two years, we sold that business because in retrospect, we realized we weren't really sure what problem we were fixing. 
right? It was almost more of an optimization of how do we make more ad revenue? How do we get more users? Versus like, what are we actually fixing? Like, what is the outcome of this product on the customer? What is the thing that we actually are proud of in terms of the impact we're having on their life? Um, and so that uh, way of saying it, I couldn't say when I was in that chapter, but if you guys are ever in an experience like that, you'll realize it because basically you feel like, uh, you know, when someone asks you what you're doing, you're kind of like, oh, it's a stealth project. That usually means you don't want to share it because you're not proud of what you're doing or you don't know what it is that you're doing even, right? Ideally, when you find something you really care about and are really excited about, you're going to be shouting it out to the world constantly because it's literally the thing you cannot stop thinking about. Um, and smart Stanford students can always figure out ways to optimize systems, optimize revenue streams. That doesn't mean it's a business. A business is more about fixing something that you're truly, truly passionate about and connected to and can't imagine not doing. So we ended up selling the business. I would say it was an uh, important chapter in my life to figure out kind of what matters in the context of building a startup, not just having a business for the sake of it. And so that uh, led to a bunch of introspection. Um, this is actually Palo Alto Foothills Park, which is a beautiful spot right across uh, the 280. I encourage folks to go check it out if they haven't been there. Uh, but I used to go there every Sunday, actually, and uh, almost detach in some ways. And I think in the world we live in today with smartphones, it's actually a little bit harder to do this, but even more important, I would argue. Um, all of you guys are in school right now, so you have quarters, semesters as a mechanism to figure out uh, what classes you like, don't like, what you want to keep doing, stop doing. When you start working, you no longer have quarters and semesters. You just have life. And if you don't create a structure that actually enables you to go choose when to revisit what your projects are or decide what you want to do next, you could have 10 years pass by and you don't even know if you wanted to keep doing what you're doing. So for me, going into nature or creating that forced time of introspection actually was really helpful to decide that that previous chapter was no longer what I wanted to focus on. I wanted to try doing something uh, quite different. And so that leads to a uh, little bit more of a story around Gusto. Um, I actually was also going to ask, I mean, how many folks have been paid through Gusto? Uh, we have one here. That's good. So we heard that before. But it's uh, exciting to hear, obviously, folks using the product, um, experiencing it. We'll talk more about the business and how we approach building it. But I wanted to start by more talking about uh, the people side of it. So these are actually my two co-founders. Um, like I said, we were all electrical engineering at Stanford. We, uh, Eddie and I did undergrad together um, from 01. Tomer and I actually met when he came out for his master's and PhD. And um, what really drew us together uh, was much more of a connection around core values and this underlying desire to fix a problem. We had actually all had prior startups. We had all um, tried building businesses in various ways, learned from it. And so when we actually got together, it was much more of a discussion, not just around products, businesses, problems, but actually like, what do you want to do with your life? What is your goal for the next 5, 10, 20 years? And when we realized we had a connection there in terms of our underlying motivations for why we even care about tech and products and startups, um, that's what drew us together. So I put a photo here of my wedding actually from two years ago because I really do, if you guys are considering it, think of founder relationships like marriages. Um, and our wives call us work husbands anyways, so it's a, a relevant metaphor <laughs> either way. Um, but really, above all, I think people get caught up in thinking about, well, we need to have a business person, an engineering person. What we need to have is an alignment around what you stand for as a person, right? And that's a much, much different conversation than just pattern matching on you know, complementary skill sets, per se. Um, so our inspirations for starting Gusto, um, as I mentioned, we had this shared value system. How did we even get into the market that we're in? How did we become aware of this pain point? Well, we had all run prior startups. So that was definitely one of the inputs. Um, I had run my prior business. I had used a product I wasn't very happy with. So we all had felt some of that frustration ourselves. And then these are pictures of our families. Um, we actually realized that all of us had exposure. This is Eddie's family. His mom runs a small doctor's office, his dad's doctor's office. And she had done payroll and benefits by hand on the kitchen table for a good 20, 25 years. And he didn't think that made sense. Uh, Tomer in the middle, his father owns a small clothing store in Haifa, Israel. It's a one, two person clothing store. Tomer had grown up working in the small business. He had also done a lot of things by hand, didn't think that made sense. And then this is my wife's family. My mother-in-law actually runs payroll 
as well, and I had seen some of the frustration she went through in that experience. So when folks give you advice, think about a pain point you have. Um, you know, it's not just what you have as a consumer pain point. Like we had all had this pain point in building our businesses, building our products, and had some family exposure to that same pain point, and that's how we got into this space, right? We definitely did not know a lot about it 10 years ago. I would say in the last five years, we've learned quite a bit about this market. Um, so that leads to my piece of advice here around um, kind of, again, there's many ways to build a business, many ways to think about creating a company. The one that I most am authentic to, the one I most evangelize, falls into the bucket of a mission-driven business. But it's, it's not creating a business for the sake of it. Gusto does not exist because I want it to exist. Right? We're solving a problem by building a business. Um, so it all starts with the problem. And if you start with that as your origin point, then you have a bunch of considerations to make, like is it a big enough problem? Do enough people get affected by it? Um, is what I'm going to create actually going to fix the problem or make the problem worse perhaps, right? So there's a lot of corresponding questions to ask, but at the end of the day, it all starts with the problem. And is it something that you actually really feel like you could spend years and years working on? And so for us, there's two poor, core parts of the problem here I wanted to highlight. Uh, number one is just the sheer amount of manual pain and unnecessary process that a business goes through. So that was not just pain we had felt, family had felt, but like every year a third of companies in the US get fined for incorrectly doing their payroll taxes and lots of folks doing it on pen and paper. So we knew there was a lot of pain. And then, and how did we learn that? We talked to lots of businesses, right? I think people get caught up in staying in their rooms and just wanting to go Google stuff to figure out if there's a problem or not. We went and talked to dozens and hundreds of companies, not just in the Bay Area, but went and called and talked to folks across the country to figure out, is there a lot of folks feeling this pain and we realized there was. Uh, and then the second problem is um, a little bit more if you've seen the movie Office Space. It's a good movie from a while back, but it uh, kind of is a caricature of how many businesses are run. As we spent more time in the industry, we came across terminology like uh, human capital management, human resources. Uh, ADP is a large company in our space called Automated Data Processing. Uh, and we just really got bothered by those terminologies. Like, People are not data, they're not capital, and they're not resources. Like, they're human beings, and they should be treated that way. And so we had a very different point of view on how the product could actually help you build great teams. Right? It's not just about getting paid on time or setting up health insurance or creating a 401k. It's these life moments. Like, How do you feel when you join a company and when you got that offer and your first day on the job and meeting your colleagues? And do you feel appreciated for your work? And so a lot of questions that I'm sure many of you guys care about um, in the companies you've worked at, uh, we think every company ultimately can and should care about. So I'll share one thing on Gusto and then go back to more lessons. Um, but this is our view of the future. We think that every company everywhere will ultimately have a people platform, a core system that they use whenever they want to build a team, pay that team, and help that team do great work. Uh, that includes things from industries like HR, payroll, and benefits. But almost no one at Gusto, and we're over 400 people now, have ever really worked in those industries. We have people in compliance for sure, but most of us approach it more from first principles, thinking about really what is the right experience here? What would an employer prefer to have? What would an employee prefer to have? And that leads to a very different set of ideas and thoughts versus just looking at the existing landscape. And so that concept here of work and life, I think many of you guys probably think about quite a bit as you're contemplating entering the workforce. Um, I've always believed, we've always believed that uh, work and life should not be at odds with each other, right? You know, work empowers life, life happens at work. It's not like it's a you know, professional you and a personal you, hopefully it's just you. Um, we see every company again moving more and more in that direction because that's what helps you keep a great team. Otherwise people will move on and, and try to go to different jobs. And so our focus is on bringing that to everyone. Um, today, our focus, obviously, is uh, in the United States. So I think one of the lessons there um, is actually to celebrate what you don't know. Um, if we had spent a lot of time, for example, working in this industry, I think you get caught up with a lot of legacy knowledge. You get caught up with how it's been done before. And then you end up trying to build a better, faster, cheaper version of what already exists. In reality, it's actually kind of good to just have that lack of knowledge because then you can challenge those assumptions. You don't even know there is an assumption. You can just imagine what it could be. And then, you know, if someone doesn't like it, then obviously that's probably not a good direction to go. But if you've now imagined it, 
and it becomes really valuable, all of a sudden you've had an insight or an innovation that wasn't around before. And one of the best ways to think about this is imagining back 125 years ago, you know, people didn't want um, faster horses, they, they wanted to move faster. So someone had to go invent a car. But if you did a lot of research in the industry and talked to everyone that was involved in, in horse breeding, you would have never gotten to a car, you would have simply gotten to faster horse mechanisms, right? So you have to take that leap of faith. And in many ways, that's the benefit of being uh, a first time entrepreneur or someone who has not worked in an industry is you can challenge those assumptions from day one. I mean, for us, it was, as we talked to people, things like payroll and HR are really seen as chores, right? They're mostly seen as, as chores, hassles. Um, they're seen as uh, headaches or nightmares at times, depending on how much pain people go through. But for us, we really thought about it more as uh, as these amazing building blocks. Like we literally pay people. I walk around San Francisco with my Gusto shirt on and people are like, payroll guy, right? Like literally we send an email every two weeks that says, you got paid today. It's a pretty good email to send. The click through rate and the open rate is really high. Um, and so we thought about these building blocks as being really special, like making sure people feel appreciated for their work, helping employers show that appreciation. Um, and so we just always thought that it would be this thing people would really connect to and care about. Uh, but that was never the way it worked in the past. And today, with uh, four years of being a live company, um, you know, we've now reached over 40,000 businesses with really high customer satisfaction. I would say we've made some good progress in proving that thesis to be true. Um, the other piece of advice I have is really more around uh, I guess the, the pitfall here of taking shortcuts. Um, you know, again, being born and raised in Silicon Valley, I see a, a couple pitfalls here. One is that um, people get caught up in the echo chamber at times and think about, you know, how do you get somewhere faster? Can you cut corners? That can manifest in how you approach fin financing. You know, fundraising is, is not the goal. It's an enabler for you to go achieve a goal. But that means that you shouldn't think about fundraising as the thing to celebrate. It's, it's building a sound business along the way. And I think Silicon Valley, in the cycle as it goes ups and downs, through its ups and downs, sometimes forgets that message. Um, another pitfall is around team. Like it's great to hire people, but the goal is not to have a bigger team. The goal is to have more customers and be a sound business. A byproduct of that is the ability to hire more people. So sometimes you'll meet founders and folks talking about you know, how much they've raised or how big their team is. Like those are good metrics, but really what's exciting is like, do your customers love your product and how many of them are there, right? That's actually the core metric. Everything else follows from that. And when folks get confused and want to go build bigger teams or raise lots of money for the sake of it, you start getting lost on why does your business exist in the first place. Uh, and then the third pitfall is really around um, comparison. I think it's easy to get caught up in wanting to look at you versus someone else. Uh, ultimately, you should really try to compare yourself to what you think your potential is. And so in our business, that means we don't really talk a lot about ADP or Paychex. Um, these are huge companies where it's 40 and $20 billion, but we didn't build those companies. We didn't build those products, right? What we're building is Gusto. We're building our product. So our focus is on talking to our customer, serving them well, and then getting better constantly. And it actually avoids a lot of the distraction that comes when you want to you know, either look at other companies, competitors, talk about what's happening. Talk is easy. What matters is serve the customer well. Um, the other advice I have is related to fundraising. Um, I've always seen it as hiring. So we have over 50 CEOs as investors in Gusto, and we're really proud to have these folks involved. They're uh, amazing individuals. We would have probably honestly paid them to be involved instead of them giving us money. So it's kind of a surreal dynamic. But we knew they got involved because they wanted to fix this problem. And so, you know, for my example here, like, when I think about VCs, the average length of time I've known a VC before I work with them is actually over three years. And my favorite way to get to know them, if you know me a little bit now, is to go hiking. So I go hiking with every investor and try to figure out like who they are as a person. Like what do they care about? What do they stand for? Uh, what are their core values? Like why do they go into becoming a VC? How do they measure success? I try to get to know them as a human being because if we're gonna start working together, hopefully for years, I want to know them as a person, not just as a, as a deal. And I think a lot of folks think of fundraising simply as a financing event. It is hiring, right? You actually can't fire a VC. So it's part-time, they're not with you all times, but they're there on the team and you want them to be there on your team. So my biggest advice on fundraising is think about it as hiring. And in our case, that means aligned values, shared motivations, relevant skill set. 
Um, but a lot of folks rush through that and just look at it being as capital and then they regret it afterwards. Um, another thing here I also love to spotlight and we have a couple more left and then love to open it up to Q&A um, is, uh, is this idea really around um, community in a business. And you know, it's fun for us to do photos and yeah, we have a good time together. Um, we call ourselves guesties. It's, uh, it's just a funny inside joke. And if you guys notice, we also take our shoes off in the office. That's because we started the company in a house in Palo Alto. We uh, simply kept that tradition. So today in Denver and San Francisco, everyone walks around in socks. It's pretty sweet, highly recommend it. If you guys join companies, start companies, it's a lot more comfortable that way. But um, I think there's a core message here where people get caught up in thinking about a business purely as just, again, product or financials. It's a group of people, right? Every business, every organization is a group of people coming together that want to go fix something. They want to go solve something. They have some connection to each other. And as a result, it's a community. And if you want to go support that community, it means giving them a chance through how you hire and through the programs you do to connect as people, right? And it's not rocket science. We actually modeled it after college, right? When did I most connect with someone at Stanford? it was during dining hall. Like it was just chatting with someone in the dining hall. So we have dining hall, right? And it's the same table set up and we have meals. That's not very new in Silicon Valley, but I think people lost the purpose behind that. The purpose behind that is just to have it be easy and casual for folks to connect and chat with each other. Um, the shoes off thing is a bit more unique. That's something that we obviously like, but not every company has to adopt. Um, and then something else we've evolved, uh, which we love to share with you is, something we call Gust Away, but it's actually a retreat we do. And early on, it was basically the whole company just renting an Airbnb and living there for a week and doing a hackathon. Uh, and it was a chance for us to organize into teams, choose different projects, um, have a demo day at the end of it. Um, each morning, a different group of people would be in charge of cooking breakfast. This worked when we were about 10 people, then about 20, then about 45, and then it no longer fit in one house or two houses. Um, so we've evolved it to Gust Away, which is actually us renting a Boy Scout camp for a whole week. Folks going like 100 at a time for at least one night. And no one cooks there. We don't cook, people cook for us, but same spirit. It's a chance for us to spend some time in the woods, um, connect as teammates, do some projects, exercises, but also just have a good time. So my um, kind of, Biggest piece of advice I would say, and then I have one more for you as students, um, is if you're thinking of starting a company, there's a big difference between wanting to start a company for the sake of it or doing it as something that you're so obsessed about, wanting to fix something that you literally are forced into starting a company to make it better. And if you're more in the latter camp, a good way to test that theory is to ask yourself, imagine this is the 10,000th time you're describing your business. Will you be as excited and as sincerely enthusiastic as the first time? because by that point you can't fake it. It either has to be authentic, it has to be natural, or it's gonna be a chore. Uh, and that's worked really well for me. My last company did not have that dynamic. Um, and as a result, when we went through the acquisition process, it was the right decision for that business because we didn't really know what our purpose was. It was harder to build a team as a result. I couldn't evangelize because I didn't really know what our due north was. Uh, with Gusto, I hope to be doing this for many, many decades to come. Uh, I'd say we've made some good progress in the last four or five years, but we have a lot more to do. But you know, this is my millionth time describing Gusto. And it's, it's always a privilege, always an honor to talk about it because I really care about what I'm doing. And you have to find that in whatever makes sense for you. Obviously, it's your own business, your own project, maybe your own non-business activity, maybe it's an academia. But think about what really you enjoy doing and then um, use this rubric to figure out if it's something you can do for many years to come. Uh, and so my, my biggest advice piece here for students is actually related to um, this idea, I think we were talking about it at lunch of, you know, FOMO is a popular way to put it these days. Um, a lot of behaviors, a lot of tendencies being driven by uh, this fear of missing out, this what is the popular way to do it, what is the uh, natural thing to do. Right now actually starting a company is the popular thing to do and that means probably many folks should not start companies because doing something because it's the thing to do is actually probably the fastest way to become really unhappy and frustrated with it because eventually you'll realize that there are no grades in life, right? Like when you're in school, there are grades. You have a very clear sign of hopefully success or failure. In life, there are no grades. And so all of a sudden you're now figuring out like what is happiness for me? What is my journey? And if you don't take time to 
uh, again, detach from that, take some time for introspection, um, challenge yourself, be uncomfortable, you're gonna end up doing something that perhaps you don't like. And uh, there are some tracks that definitely have more structure. Um, at one point I wanted to be a medical doctor that has a lot more structure with a lot more coursework. Um, but if you end up choosing the entrepreneurial path, realize that it is deeply a personal journey. There is no definition of success beyond like hopefully it being something you wanna do for a long, long time. So uh, in summary on three pieces of advice here, it's uh, definitely as much as you can Take time for introspection. Um, remember that in school that's there automatically, but afterwards it goes away. So create a monthly, a quarterly, an annual process to figure out how you want to spend your time. And uh, for me, it works really well to do that in nature or to do that through travel. Um, it was the inspiration at Gusto for one of our kind of benefits. Everyone in the company on their one year anniversary gets a free plane ticket anywhere in the world. Um, and it expires on the second year anniversary. And that's because we've always thought of, I've always thought of travel as a great way to detach and figure out how I want to spend my time. And so we thought that'd be a cool way to have everyone else benefit around that same concept of take time for introspection. But again, um, feel, free to, feel free to bring that into your companies if you want. That's not one that we uh, want to keep only ourselves. Um, it works really well for us, but might not work well for everyone. Um, second one is that there are no shortcuts. Um, you know, I think you're all in engineering. That means you have a masochistic tendency in some ways. That's good. That means you like being challenged. You like learning. You like, you know, confronting obstacles and overcoming them. Um, that's the best way to learn. I mean, the most learning I've ever done is when I'm in a position where I have to do it. I take on the responsibility. I used to run our sales teams. I used to run our marketing teams. I used to run our finance teams, our legal teams. Um, by doing that, I learned a lot in that process. I've now hired some amazing folks, but... Um, don't shy away from that. It's, it's one of the best ways to learn. And then three is the, uh, the main concept here of imagine that 10,000th time describing your journey, uh, what you're up to, what your focus is, and imagine will you be as excited and as enthusiastic as the first time you're doing it. Um, so those are kind of some of the main advice points and thoughts, ideas I wanted to share with you guys today. Happy to open it up to Q&A on any of these topics or anything else on your guys' mind. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I think the the fastest way to learn something, if you're now put into a position where you have to accomplish it, is by and this isn't rocket science, but there's there's reading. So there's various books, publications, literature. But probably the best way I've learned is through talking to folks. And you have alumni networks that you can tap into, friends of friends networks. But when I was, and I'm today, you know, hiring for a CFO, I went and talked to a ton of CFOs. And I went to figure out what do they do? How do they spend their time? What are their challenges? What are their obstacles? What are their priorities? How do they make decisions? And I wouldn't say I today am probably going to be a great CFO on my own, but I know that I actually now have a lot more knowledge on how that function works and how those teams uh, get their job done. So just basically don't lock yourself in a room, which I guess is the tendency these days. Go out and talk to folks. And I always find that interaction where you just ask why. It's actually one of our primary interview mechanisms. Um, but literally, when someone gives you an answer, like listen to it and then ask why. And then they give you another answer and then just say why again. It's kind of like channeling your inner four-year-old. Um, but it's actually a great way to like peel back layers of an onion. And the way my brain works, it's a very structured way of thinking. I like to deconstruct problems, simplify them, figure out the key moving pieces. So it's actually signal processing. It's just applied not in a math context, it's applied now to like how businesses run, how the economy functions, you know, how market forms. But to me, it's the same exact uh, thought process. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Did you have any other ideas before starting back here? More ideas. Um, I'd say we had, uh, I had problem spaces, but they're more philosophical. I'm happy to share those with you, but we pretty quickly got excited about Gusto. And again, for us, it's about the way a business is built, how teams are formed, you know, how you do all these complex behind the scenes things in software. And we just, we just fell in love with that because we saw how much opportunity there was. Um, but the framework I had was, was really thinking about what had been missing in my last startup, actually. Um, I had had a startup in college that was a nonprofit and I had this juxtaposition between the two. Because remember my, my last chapter, my last startup, I, I had kind of, we've been building it, we had thousands of dollars a day in ad revenue, but something was clearly missing. Whereas with a nonprofit, I was doing it from like midnight to 4 a.m. for two years. 
I wasn't getting paid because it was a nonprofit, but it definitely did not feel like a job. It felt like a purpose. And so what I concluded was it's the problem. So for me, the three problems that I will always be most excited about, either they connect to Gusto or some of the angel investments I've made are um, number one, like businesses that are involved in um, helping someone make a living doing something they love doing. So that's an abstract concept, but that's what I loved about Zazzle was you could actually be an artist anywhere in the world, um, go put a product into the marketplace and then make a living by actually other people buying it. And there's other marketplaces like that obviously today in effect, but this idea of enabling folks to follow their passions, follow their dreams and be able to get paid for it and actually have that become not just their hobby, but also their professional career really excited me. Um, the second one was uh, problems, businesses that are involved in helping people um, do something they always wanted to do. There's something there about empowerment that's really amazing. I think a lot of what technology does in the world today is take things that only a certain subsegment of folks were able to do, either because of status or because of economic uh, resource, and basically drop it to become much, much more accessible for others. And then the third one is businesses that bring massive time savings, cost savings, efficiency to the world. And in that third bucket, you can almost take any category in B2B software, almost any industry. One of my friend's companies called Flexport is doing import-export, making it simpler, easier for you to go move products between countries. All these different industries have really archaic software systems, are massive, massive industries. Um, so maybe that gives you as a framework some ideas, but uh, in terms of how they apply to you, I would say think about also really what problems you connect with. Um, it is a very personal choice. Yeah. Back close to that day one when you had your first software, you have to sell it. Yes. How in the world can you sell your first one? Yes. So our um, first 10 customers on Gusto were actually friends companies. Um, but then once we were ready to launch, we actually didn't launch publicly uh, for over a year. And that's because in our market, uh, there are definitely no shortcuts. We're doing very mission critical things. Today we move tens of billions of dollars through the system. We do hundreds of millions of forms and filings. And so um, we waited a year, launched publicly, put up a website, and then PR was actually one of our biggest ways to drive traffic. So it's organic. Word of mouth has been our biggest growth driver. Uh, we don't have a very high touch outbound sales team. We're not knocking on people's doors. We're serving small business today. So our focus is primarily companies one to 150 employees. And the beauty is that people's behaviors have changed in that way. So 20 years ago, you would have never sold software to small business because um, they don't pay you enough for you to go send someone to knock on their door. But today that small business owner is on Google searching, they're looking at review websites, they're on social media looking at what their friends recommend. So they're not actually wanting someone to go push it to them, they actually wanna go discover it themselves. And so we can leverage things like Google, Facebook, et cetera, word of mouth to actually drive quite a bit of attention and interest. Folks sign up on our website and then they convert to becoming a customer. And how much do, do they have to pay to try your stuff out? Yeah, so we have a subscription business. Uh, it costs uh, $39 a month per company, yeah. and then $6 per employee per month. So as the size of your company grows, we make additional revenue, but that's because we're doing more work for you. And we give folks a one month free trial, and over 98% convert from the free trial to paid. Makes sense, because once you're using the product, we're already now serving you. Um, and so you just continue to stay with it over time. One thing I would add actually um, on a technology trend that many of you guys can hopefully leverage as well, uh, our product really would not have been possible to build 10 years ago. Uh, and it's because the technologies we're leveraging weren't around really, and the behaviors were not right. So when you onboard to Gusto, you're giving us very sensitive information. Your EIN, your SSN, your bank numbers, your routing numbers, your family data, your corporate data, and then you know, 10 days later, we're pulling $20,000 from your bank account automatically, right? So 10 years ago, people would never have done that in a web browser, but today people are much more comfortable and familiar with cloud-based technology. We didn't have to go communicate and educate folks on that. We can simply benefit from that trend. And same thing with mobile. Uh, many of these small business owners don't have corporate offices. They're on the go. And so you know, they weren't gonna go home late at night and install some payroll software onto their family computer while their <coughs> kid's playing a video game at 10 p.m. Right, they were gonna do it by hand, manually. That was better. But now, with everyone having a computer in their pocket, we can actually help them in a way that was never possible before. So whenever you're looking at a market or a technology trend, you wanna see if there's something happening that actually creates a big behavior shift. 
um, and then a whole new market can open up as a result. Um, this market we're focused on has been in pain for a long, long time. We felt like now was the right time for it to be fixed, finally. And uh, I'd say we've made some good progress, but it's, it's awesome for small business owners. These are incredible folks. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a, a road trip coast to coast in April, driving an RV to go meet small businesses for 10 days across the country. Um, and it's really fun because uh, it's very different stories, very different types of companies, um, bakeries, flower shops, cafes, churches, hotels. And, uh, and they represent a huge part of not just the economy in America, but also the economy around the world. And then people who subscribe, yeah. do, do they talk to you? Or is it more or less all self-done online and you never yeah. deal with them directly? So I think this is also a pitfall in Silicon Valley at times, is thinking that somehow it needs to be all software or no software. You want to just be very pragmatic about it. So for us, all of the tax filings, all the payments, all the insurance enrollment, we do in software. Because software is way better than people at filling out forms, it's a very binary process. I use the analogy, when you send a message to someone in Gmail, you don't have to know how SMTP and IMAP work to send them a message. Same thing, you should not have to know how all these rules work to go hire someone. But if they have a question, they can call us, they can chat with us, they can email us, and we're always gonna be there to give them help. So much of it is DIY, but if someone does have a question, we give them an amazing experience, and then as soon as that call ends, we try to figure out how to prevent it from happening ever again. A voice call. Voice, chat, email, whatever you want will enable you to talk to us. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned that not having worked in the payroll industry kind of gave you like a different approach to other business, but having, like, did your work at Zazzle um, in any way help you with your business? Like, the fact that you didn't go into business directly, but you actually worked somewhere else before yeah. starting your own? Yeah, I would say there's, there's two thoughts there. Um, I'll reaffirm my, my core message that there is no one path. It, it, I think that's the fun part of when I was transitioning from student life to work life is realizing, because in school we're all trained and educated to have a clear path to define success. It's getting into a good school. You guys got into Stanford, congratulations. It's getting good grades. It's getting into the next level of the program. But again, like all that goes away. You can make up whatever structure you want after school to define your happiness in life. Um, so for me, uh, everything I've done has informed in some way the way I operate. Zazzle absolutely informed it. I decided to join Zazzle out of school because I really wanted to learn how to go build software in a professional context. And up to that point, I had mostly done hobby projects. So definitely it helped me. But at Gusto, working on the product engineering side has not been my focus. My two co-founders have been the ones to really lead those efforts. I definitely love having more of a product bias because that's a part of my DNA but much of my time has been spent more on running our sales and marketing teams. Um, so I would say, like above all, again, know that there is no right or wrong way to do it. Each experience you have can be a learning experience. Now, if your goal is to keep building out different skill sets, that's healthy. Um, and definitely if one is like how to go build software in a modern way, joining a company that's fast growing, probably post series A out of school, where they can attract really great people, um, is a really, really nice uh, sweet spot. The reason for that is, is the growth piece of it. Whenever a company is growing quickly, new jobs are created, change is happening. And as a result, you have a chance to keep growing with that company very, very quickly. Um, so whenever folks ask me for advice on jobs out of school, I always say two things. One, growth, find a company. And if you knew exactly which company is gonna grow fastest, you should be a VC. And then, so obviously there's a little bit of trickiness there, but you can look at uh, the best VC firms, the companies they've backed, you know, them being in a specific size where the next five years will be a really interesting chapter in terms of new roles and new functions and new projects being created. And then two is the values of the team. Like you become like the people you spend time with no matter what, whether you want to or not. So really in the process of getting to know a company, figure out um, do they share your philosophy? Do you want to become like them? Do you like the way they think? Um, are you aligned with it? Because um, you would ideally uh, work at a place that is where you want to become more like in the future. Uh, QuickBooks has been out there for a long time. Lots of small companies yeah. use QuickBooks. Is yours uh, uh, a payroll system that works with QuickBooks, or, yeah. or uh, uh, how, how does that all work? Yes, yeah, so the question was around a software called QuickBooks. Um, so the way we think about it is you have 
a really important part of your business that's the finance part of your business, and then you have the people part of your business. We're very focused on the people part of the business. So we don't do accounting software, we don't do bookkeeping software. Our focus is on how do you build your team, how do you go pay them, how do you stay compliant, but it's all around the people side of your company. So we partner with QuickBooks and Intuit pretty closely, and a lot of our customers end up using Gusto plus QuickBooks. I would think so. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I had a question about the name, because I know it used to be called Zen Payroll. Yeah. Officially, it's like, what about the transition and how did that happen? Yes, so we used to be known as Zen Payroll, as you mentioned. And uh, yeah, it's a funny slash very short story. We, uh, we actually only had a few days to choose the name Zen Payroll. And it cost us $7 on GoDaddy, and so we chose it, but it was always a temporary name. Um, and that's because we knew that it was a limiting name. Um, it has some existing words like payroll in it. And again, most people at Gusto don't come from this industry. We really don't agree with the existing definitions. Um, we think about it as a very different uh, view of what the future can look like. And so um, we knew we were going to change it. We just had to find the right time to change it. Uh, and so we did it when we launched a lot of our benefits offerings. Um, my advice on naming in general is to think about it really as a vessel. It's definitely not the only thing that matters, but it's one thing that does matter. But if you think about it as a vessel, you know, you fill that vessel with meaning by serving your customer well. Um, we just wanted a better vessel. Uh, and that's why we made the name change from Zen Payroll to Gusto. And Gusto for us is all about this energy, this enthusiasm, this passion people have when they are doing work they really love, they're good at, um, or when you're an entrepreneur starting a company that's successful, and it works, you know, that's Gusto. So we really hope that Gusto in the future is connected to that vibrancy, that enthusiasm. Um, whereas Imperial was a good name, but ultimately was more about just keeping things running smoothly. Uh, we like the, the passion side of it. Good question. Yeah. Should we wrap up? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. It's a true honor to be here with you guys today. Uh, I'm excited for all the folks watching online as well. Um, as you mentioned, I, my name is Josh. I'm the CEO co-founder of Gusto. Uh, and I have a cool fact to share. I actually took this class about, let's see, 12 years ago. Uh, I was an undergrad master's student in electrical engineering at Stanford, uh, did signal processing. And uh, another fun fact, the three co-founders of Gusto were all electrical engineering from Stanford, and we're all technically PhD dropouts from the EE program here. So if you're in the program, stay in it. If not, things will work out if you decide to leave. But um, what I wanted to do today was uh, kind of go through a couple chapters of my life, my journey, hopefully share some advice um, that's constructive to everyone here. The, uh, the quick summary on Gusto, though, is we're a company today, about 400 people based in San Francisco and Denver. Uh, we serve over 40,000 companies. Uh, so that gives you a little bit about my family. Um, my childhood, um, jumping photos are just fun. So I thought I'd put up a jumping photo. Hopefully everyone here has done a jumping photo at some point in their life. I highly recommend it. But a uh, big part of my childhood was um, two things. Uh, Boy Scouts, my brother and I are both Eagle Scouts. Um, so a chance to really appreciate and enjoy the outdoors, uh, which is again, one of the beautiful aspects of being in the Bay Area. And then also uh, crew. And I've actually given some talks before where I talk about crew, which is rowing, as a great metaphor for leadership. We would row in uh, eight-person boats, um, so four on each side. I was starboard. Uh, it's about a 2,000-meter race. So it's over in less than six minutes. And the way it connects to leadership and management is you have this individual action you have to do, which is to pull in an oar. It's a very basic action. It's very personal. You want to just pull it as hard as you can, as fast as you can. Um, but then you have the balance in the boat, right? So you're literally like an inch off the water and you have four people on each side and you're trying to figure out how to be in sync because if you're not in sync, you're basically going to be banging lines today across the U.S. with uh, what we offer, which is payroll, health insurance, HR. And we have investors um, that we're really proud of, the founders of uh, Instagram, PayPal, uh, Yelp, Evernote, Eventbrite, et cetera. Come on in. 
So like I said, the um, goal here is to be pretty interactive. If you guys want to jump in and ask questions during as well, um, and or at the end, we can do either. Um, but we're going to basically go through kind of three different arcs. It'll be really focused around a little bit about me. I've always found when I was a student in these classes, sometimes people just dive into company or professional work. It's a lot more interesting if you can get a bit of a connection to the individual and see the connections, see the similarities probably more than the differences in our backgrounds. Um, but then I'll talk about my time here at Stanford and also obviously what we're up to at Gusto. More importantly, some of the lessons for you guys, assuming that you want to start a company yourself in the future or are planning to join a startup. So diving in, uh, a little bit about me. I was um, born and raised in the Bay Area, one of the few locals. Um, so if you guys have ever been up to Marin, right across the Golden Gate Bridge, it's uh, where I grew up. Um, awesome place for hiking. If anyone afterwards wants to get some hiking advice, I have some tips for you. Uh, and this is a picture of my family. Uh, I have one brother, and yes, our mother is about a foot shorter than the two of us and my dad. Uh, all I can say there is that powerful people come in small packages. Um, but uh, the other thing I would add on, on family and background, um, my parents are both the first in their families to go to college. My mom is actually an immigrant, came to the US when she was 18 from Bolivia. Um, and my dad is actually from a small steel town outside of Pittsburgh. His whole family had grown up working in uh, the steel factories and brick factories there. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about entrepreneurship, tech startups. But um, my definition of entrepreneurship is not just about tech startups. It's actually much more about a mindset where you want to change the way your life works, change the way the world works in some way. My mother moving to a whole new country, learning a whole new language, putting herself through school to me is a great example of entrepreneurship which I think we can all draw inspiration from. Left and right and not going anywhere. And then you have a coxswain who's there um, basically helping to guide direct, but they can't make you do anything. Literally, they're just there talking, right? But done right, they actually are a big part of your inspiration. They're a big part of how you work together in a common direction. So you see the connection to team building. Um, but for me, it was just fun to compete and try to win races. Um, and that takes me to Stanford. Um, my parents are both teachers, actually. My dad taught high school in San Francisco Unified for a good 20 plus years, but much more on the uh, English, history, social studies side of the house. And my mom was a Spanish and French teacher. So uh, I didn't really have any exposure to technology per se growing up, um, but I was always interested in uh, software and interested in how things worked. But Stanford was really, I would say, the first deep dive into what we now call tech startups. And so I came to Stanford in 2001. It was right after the bubble had burst. So a uh, unique time to come to campus. I think between 01 and 03, there was actually a 40% decline in enrollment in the CS major, is what I was told. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's been 